And we are beginning this morning uh, our study of God's attributes. And before we dive into that, I just want to give uh, kind of an introduction uh, to the attributes of God. Uh, first of all, Exodus 34, verses 5 through 7. It says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. You see there, God reveals himself to Moses as being loving, but also just. I'm merciful and gracious, but I will not clear the guilty. I'm not going to declare innocent uh, someone who's violated my laws. And so uh, love and justice, which are often seen as incompatible attributes, are both a part of God's nature. And the point I want to drive home with this is that uh, God's attributes cannot be separated from one another. Uh, they cannot be pitted against one another. It's not like a bowl of Lucky Charms, right, where some spoonfuls you get marshmallows and other spoonfuls you get that cardboard stuff. Uh, that's not how you think of God's attributes. It's not like some actions are loving and other actions are just, or some actions are uh, holy, whatever. No, everything that God does is an expression of all of God's attributes. Um, I think of it like when you when you buy a gallon of paint from Home Depot, uh, and they they have that cool machine that mixes it. You know, they put those little droplets. It starts out white, and they put like a tiny amount of color in there and mix it all up, and suddenly the whole thing is. Um, if you were to sample the top part of the jar and the bottom part, it's the same color. It's permeated throughout the entire can, um, and that's the way we need to think about God's attributes. Each action of God is a demonstration of all of God's attributes. And so when we discuss the attributes of God, we need to realize that uh, they do not contradict one another. Um, God is simple, which in theology refers to he's not made up of parts or components. He is one uh, essence, one being. There's not one part of God that's just and another part that's loving. There's not one part that's immutable and another part that's gracious. God is all of his attributes all of the time. And so when God acts, he does so in keeping with all of his attributes. And so God's love is immutable. His justice is omniscient and so forth. You can qualify each attribute of God by the other attributes. Uh, A.W. Tozer said, between his attributes, no contradiction can exist. He need not suspend one to exercise another, for in him, all his attributes are one. All, all of God does all that God does. He does not divide himself to perform a work, but works in the total unity of his being. An attribute, then, is a part of God. It is how God is. So when we uh, study the attributes of God, each attribute is a way of describing one aspect of God's total character and being. Uh, we're, we're not able to grasp all of God's character at once. Uh, we've already talked about the incomprehensibility of God. Um, so the way that Scripture teaches us about what God is like is he gives us a view of God from different perspectives. But those different attributes are never in opposition to one another. Again, Tozer wrote, uh, the divine attributes are what we know to be true of God. He does not possess them as qualities. They are how God is as he reveals himself to his creatures. Love, for instance, is not something God has and which may grow or diminish or cease to be. His love is the way God is. And when he loves, he is simply being himself. And so with the other attributes. Uh, the first attribute we're going to talk about, and probably the only one we're going to get to this morning, is omnipresence. God is omnipresent, which means that he is present at every point in space. Uh, Wayne Grudem defines omnipresence this way. God does not have <clears throat> size or spatial dimension and is present at every point of space with his whole being. A uh, few verses for this. Jeremiah 23, verse 23. Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? 
Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? I love those uh, that last verse there where he's asking questions and then saying it's actually a declaration. Um, so these are rhetorical questions meant to, to say, yes, God fills heaven and earth. He permeates all of space with his entire being. It is impossible to limit God to one spatial location. Uh, Solomon acknowledged this reality when he built, when he built uh, the temple. Of course, the temple was supposed to be God's house on earth, right? His dwelling place among the children of Israel. And yet Solomon even said, well, it's kind of weird that we're building this for you because obviously you can't be contained in a building with four walls. Uh, 1 Kings 8.27, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven in the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. And so when we see places in the Bible that speak of God dwelling in heaven, uh, or God dwelling in the temple, that being the place of God's presence, that is not to be understood as limiting God's presence to that location. Those are places of special manifestations of the presence of God, but he is present everywhere. Uh, Stephen Charnock wrote on this subject, he said, this truth is not weakened by the expressions in Scripture where God is said to dwell in heaven and in the temple. He is indeed said to sit in heaven and to dwell on high, but he is nowhere said to dwell only in the heavens as confined to them. It is the court of his majestical presence, not the prison of his essence. I love the way Puritans write things. Uh, God's not imprisoned in heaven just because he's more... Uh, his presence is more uh, visible there and more, in a sense, <clears throat> the manifestation of God's presence is more explicit in heaven, but that's not to mean that he's confined to that location. Uh, continuing on, it is the court of his majestical presence, not the prison of his essence. For when we are told that the heaven is his throne, we are told in the same breath that the earth is his footstool. He dwells on high in regard of the excellency of his nature, but he is in all places in regard of the diffusion of his presence. So God is everywhere present. A couple of clarifications. That, that God is present in all of space does not mean we are pantheists. Okay, Pantheism is the idea that God is everything and everything is God. Uh, the trees are God and the dirt is God, whatever. Uh, if you've seen Avatar, that's basically the ideology behind that movie, is that God is nature, that it's all one, you know, that's what God is. Uh, the Bible teaches that God is distinct from, yet present in, all of creation. He is present everywhere in his creation, but he is also distinct from his creation. And Charnock used <clears throat> several analogies uh, throughout his book to illustrate this difference, that God permeates all of creation, yet there's a distinction between the created thing and, and God. I'm just going to read a few of these quotes. Nor will it follow that because God is essentially everywhere, that everything is God. God is not everywhere by any conjunction, composition, or mixture with anything on earth. When light, and here's the first analogy, is in every part of a crystal globe and encircles it close on every side, do they become one? No, the crystal remains what it is, and the light retains its own nature. God is not in us as a part of us, but as an efficient and preserving cause. And so there's the first analogy, is that a crystal Light enters the crystal, it permeates the whole thing, but we would never say the crystal becomes the light or the light becomes the crystal. They're still distinct from one another. Uh, next, I fill heaven and earth. Uh, he's quoting there from the Jeremiah 23 passage we just read. Not, I am mixed with heaven and earth. His essence is not mixed with the creatures. It remains entire in itself. The sponge retains the nature of a sponge, though en encompassed by the sea and moving in it. And the sea still retains its own nature. God is most simple. His essence, therefore, is not mixed with anything. Um, and so there's the, the second analogy is as a, a sea sponge that is filled with water, yet clearly we understand the sponge is distinct from the water. So just because God fills everything and is in all of his creation, that doesn't mean he's a part of it. Uh, next, the light of the sun is present with the air but not mixed with it. It remains light, and the air remains air. The light of the sun is diffused throughout all the hemisphere. It pierceth all transparent bodies. It seems to mix itself with all things, yet remains unmixed and undivided. The light remains light, and the air remains air. The air is not light, though it be enlightened. So that last analogy, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. So 
Uh, God, yes, he exists in everything. He is everywhere present, and yet he is distinct from his creatures. Uh, Acts 17, verse 27, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. Uh, one more quote on this. Nothing is God because it moves in him any more than a fish in the sea is the sea or a part of the sea because it moves in it. Um, so he was very careful. There's a lot more in that book on the distinction between omnipresence and pantheism. Uh, but those are just some analogies that I thought were helpful. So let's address um, a common objection to the omnipresence of God, namely hell, right? Is God present in hell? Uh, that's a question that we tend to have when we think about God is everywhere present. The one place that we tend to think of as the exception is hell. Um, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I wonder, uh, we'd probably get different answers in here if I just asked, do you think God is present in hell? Um, it, it's very common to hear Christians describe death as a separation of the body from the spirit. And then the second death, or hell, is the separation of us from God. How many of you have heard that before? Okay, pretty much everybody. Um, I, that is very commonly used language to describe hell. It's separation from God. I don't find that to be helpful. Uh, and I think it can cause confusion on this point. I think a clearer and more helpful way to describe hell is simply eternal conscious punishment. Um, and in fact, if you were in hell, uh, I'm tipping my hand here, you would wish God wasn't there because uh, what hell is, we, we tend to think of hell as, well, we're suffering under the hand of Satan or something. Uh, not at all. We are suffering under the wrath of God, just like Satan is suffering under the wrath of God in hell. Um, so, so that is, God is very much so present in hell. Um, I'm going to give a distinction here, though. He is present in hell in a sense, and he isn't in another sense. It kind of depends on what you mean by God's presence. Let's look at a few scriptures. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 says, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Okay, so... Those who are the subjects of God's judgment in hell are punished away from the presence of the Lord. So that text alone uh, would seem to indicate that God is not present in hell. And by the way, as far as I'm aware, that is the only text in the Bible that would lean in that direction, that could seem to indicate um, that God is not present in hell. There are many scriptures that state that he is. Um, here are a few examples. F Psalm 139 where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, which is one of the Hebrew words for hell, you are there. And you see the contrast. I can go up to heaven, you're there. I can go down to hell, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. And so in this text, David is, is uh, just saying it's impossible to get away from God's presence. It doesn't matter where you go in all of creation. It doesn't matter if you ascend to heaven or if you descend to hell. Uh, God is everywhere. You cannot escape his presence. And so the answer to the question is yes, God is present in hell because God is present everywhere. What the text in 2 Thessalonians is referring to is the manifestation of God's presence. Okay, so there is a distinction in Scripture. Uh, I think the best explanation to, to make this is that uh, there's a distinction between God's presence to bless and God's presence to judge. Uh, Stephen Charnock said, God is in heaven in regard to the manifestation of his glory, in, he in hell by the expressions of his justice, in the earth by the discoveries of his wisdom, power, patience, and compassion, in his people by the monuments of his grace, and in all, in regard of his substance. Okay, so we kind of have a natural understanding, I think, that in, there's a sense in which God is more present in heaven than here, right? We tend to think of that, like, yes, God's here, but not in the same way as he is in heaven. And I think if you carry that down to the way we understand hell, that's a helpful um, way to think about it. Yes, God is present in hell, but it's different than the way he's present everywhere else. So there's a sense in which <clears throat> his 
His presence of blessing is absent in hell. Yet his presence is there inflicting judgment. Let's see this distinction. Uh, Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So according to this verse, in God's presence there is joy, there is pleasure. Uh, God's presence is a great place to be. But that's referring to God's presence to bless. Others experience God's presence uh, in the opposite way, as judgment. So Hebrews 10, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of of a living God. So Psalm 16 says his presence is joy, it's gladness, it's pleasure. Hebrews 10 says it's a terrifying reality to be in God's presence. So that's the distinction between his presence to bless and his presence to judge. God is present everywhere, but not everyone experiences God's presence in the same way. And his presence to judge is an inescapable reality. You, you cannot go anywhere and get away from God's, God's judgment. Amos chapter 9 uh, teaches us the first four verses. I saw the Lord standing beside the altar, and he said, Strike the capitals upon, uh, until the thresholds shake, and shatter them on the heads of all the people. Those who are left of them I will kill with a sword. Not one of them shall flee away. Not one of them shall escape. If they dig into Sheol, from there shall my hand take them. If they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. If they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, the mountain, from there I will search them out and take them. If they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the serpent, and it shall bite them. If they go into captivity before their enemies, there I will command the sword, and it shall kill them. And I will fix my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. So there you see the distinction between his presence to bless and his presence to judge. God is very much so present in hell, but it is a different manifestation, obviously, than in heaven, uh, and a different manifestation than even on earth. Uh, Jonah is a great example of the futility of trying to escape God's omnipresence. You know, Jonah thought he could get away from God by going to Tarshish, and it did not take him long to realize uh, that plan was futile. It was not going to work out for him. So the omnipresence of God is a comfort to the righteous, and a terrifying reality to the one in sin. And in hell, God is present to judge, yet not present to bless. Those in hell are experiencing the terror of God's wrath being poured on them for their sin. They're not experiencing any of the joy and pleasures that are found being in God's presence or in his, the, the place of God's favor. I think that's the distinction. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Under his foot, there's no pleasure. But God's present in both scenarios. Um, so we can say God is present everywhere, yet God is present in a special way in certain places. He's present in heaven um, to display his glory. He manifests his presence more there. The same with the temple. You remember the story in the Old Testament, the cloud of, of God's presence would fill the temple. That was a manifestation of God's presence. He was present outside the temple as well. It was just that this place was a special location where God would show his presence more profoundly. We see this distinction in God's presence in the way Scripture talks about our relationship with God. Isaiah 59, verse 2, Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear. Okay, and then couple that with John 14, 23, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, and, and he will keep my word, my Father will love him, we will come to him and make our abode with him. So God is present everywhere, but when we're living in our sins, we do not experience the close presence of God. We don't experience His presence to bless. Abiding in Christ brings us into fellowship with the God who is always present. Um, I just want to close. i got up more here, but we don't really have time. We tend not to live in light of this reality that God is omnipresent. Uh, most of us, we don't really... Our, our actions show that we don't think about this very much. Um, as early as Genesis 3... Adam in the garden thought he could hide from God behind a tree. Uh, we sin often because we lack an awareness of God's presence. 
Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. And so the reality of God's omnipresence, that he is there, he is watching everything we do, should stir us on to obedience. Uh, David wrote in Psalm 119, 168, I keep your precepts and testimonies for or because all my ways are before you. So because the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good, therefore we ought to live in keeping with his commands. Not only is our lack of awareness of God's omnipresence revealed in our sin, but also in our fear. Fearing others or fearing circumstances shows and demonstrates the fact that we tend not to believe that God is really present. Isaiah 43 verse 5, this is a phrase, it's all throughout scripture, but fear not for I am with you. The reality of God's presence should give us courage. Again, Stephen Charnock wrote, if the presence of God be enough to strengthen against fear, then the prevailing of fear issues from our forgetfulness of it. God's omnipresence is a comfort to the just and a terror to the wicked. To us who are his children, in, in times of affliction, God's omnipresence is often felt the strongest. Uh, Psalm 27, verse 10, For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. And so it's a comfort to us that, as Jesus said, he'll never leave us uh, or forsake us. But it's also a warning. We cannot escape God. We can't. Like Jonah tried to run from him, that's not going to work out uh, in the end. 